Welcome to Mobile Rolling. It's a new initiative of H HRSA, hosted by me, Rocky Butterworth, and to my left is Lockie Stace, the harness racing nut from uh, Globe Derby, who's now calling the races, does form, he's there all the time, calls the Gawler Trials, and uh, we'll have lots of guests to talk to throughout the year, uh, old and new. Um, this, tonight we'll have Jack Bashara coming into the studio, we've got Kayla O'Horrock coming into the studio, and our CEO, Ross Neal, will come in and answer a few hard questions for us, but throughout the season, we hope that we get a lot of viewers. We're on mobilerolling.net. You can find us on the internet every week. And uh, we hope that we can increase the profile of HRSA throughout the year. Welcome, Lockie. Thank you, uh, Rocky. Harness Racing Nut, that was a little bit ambitious there with that intro. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, thank you. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to working with you and creating this internet TV show, Mobile, mobile Rolling. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it'll be good, mate. We've got uh, Mount Gambia Cup coming up this Saturday night. Yes, Aaron Bain will fly the flag for us with Ideal yeah, World down Aaron there. Yeah, Aaron Bain racing down there. You've got, uh, he's got Ideal World in the cup and he's got three cases racing yep. in, uh, racing earlier in the program. So he's up against some tough southeastern horses and some Victorian paces. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting race in that Gold Cup race on Saturday night down in Mount Gambier. And what about uh, Danny Hill on Monday at Victor Harbour? Mate, just strolled down and... Yeah, Grabbed she, five winners and Jimmy actually called the sixth one, so she wasn't far away from driving the card. Yeah, she was astonishing. I didn't want to uh, remind Jimmy of that on the way home, but yep. um, no, Ken Rogers grabbed you on the line in that uh, third race. He's still hiding under his day. bed, Kenny, apparently. Oh, yeah, exactly. He's hiding everywhere, mate. Uh, Danny <laughs> might jump out at any amount of park or uh, in the shower, she said, uh, <laughs> yeah. in that interview with Paul Court. So um, Ken should be hide, hiding at this point because that's the yep. second time. He's done that to her when she's been close to driving a program. Ken usually drives a race that she doesn't win. So, yep. um, yeah, but uh, absolutely astonishing there on Monday at Victor Harbour. Just a fantastic effort by her. And not all of them were favourites as well. Uh, that's mm. the uh, other thing, you know. She had to win on some horses that weren't considered the best hope in the race. Yep. So, um, no, well done to her. Too right. Um, we'll be back after our first break. And a very big welcome back to uh, Mobile Rolling. It's time to introduce our next guest, the CEO of Harness Racing SA, Ross Neal, is joining us in studio. Now, Ross, it's been a few months since you've taken on the role as CEO of Harness Racing SA, and over those few months, you've had to tackle a range of issues. One of the main issues is the uh, how to increase our pool of horses here in South Australia. Of course, the pool of horses is very low at the moment compared to recent years and recent seasons here in South Australia. What can we do to increase that? Yeah, the horse numbers in the state, and not, don't, not only in South, South Australia, but certainly throughout Australia are low. Um, you know, we've gone, the industry's gone from breeding uh, in excess of 10,000 mares uh, a decade ago to under 4,000 now. So that has a resultant wow. and, you know, residual flow yeah. on to uh, not only South Australia, but all other states. So because South Australia has a uh, low um, breeding, a low number breeding program. Obviously, um, we rely on imported horses into the state, primarily from Victoria, but some yeah. from other states as well. And um, if the supply dries up to a degree, then uh, we're probably at the sharp end and the ones that feel it the most. So we're looking to work with um, different organisations to, to get horses into the state. I think that syndication is a major, uh, could, can be a major player for South Australia to get people involved um, with a, at a lower cost, but uh, potentially involved with more horses than just one. And uh, we're going to be working with a number of uh, local trainers and, and local uh, interested parties to try and attract more horses to the state through you know, potentially uh, syndicated horses and horses that have got a, a future of racing in, in SA. Another problem you're facing along with the pool of horses is trying to find ways to increase prize money. Obviously, that's being, you've tried, you, you're going to have to try a few ways over the next few months or so to try and find ways to increase prize money here in South Australia. Yes, we, we um, back in August, we went to uh, rationalise the number of race meetings to two per week. And effectively what we've done is gone from an average field size of 7.9, 7.96, in fact, mm -hmm. to 9.1. Now, while that may only seem a small number, um, the growth and turnover has been uh, linear. 
um, with respect to the number of horses in, in the races. So, you know, the turnover per race is up you know, in excess of 15%, um, just as a consequence of increasing the field sizes mm. by just over an average of one. So that has improved our revenues, and, and uh, a month or so back we increased our min minimum stake for penalty races from 2,500 to 3,000. And if the trends continue, then we'll be looking to put more money back into owners' yep. pockets. Yep. Um, Ross, a really big point for us right now, and I know it's a, uh, one of your major issues to work through and you're doing a whole lot with it already, but the point of consumption tax around Australia with, within the whole industry, but we deal with harness racing because that's our, that's our passion. There's, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the industry that just say point of consumption tax and have no idea really what it is, how it works, and how much impact the government has had on harness racing in particular for us with the zero return from the 15% raise. So can you just give us a minute, two minute overview of how point of consumption works and B, the effect that it's had and how hard you're working to get some of that money back to where it belongs? Yeah, sure. The point of consumption tax is a tax on, our cor on the corporate bookmakers who operate and, it, and it's levied against people in South Australia that bet on racing Right. So with, the, with those corporate bookmakers. So effectively it's a 15% tax the bookmakers have to pay back yep. uh, or pay to the South Australian government for people, South Australian residents that wager on racing. The, the reality is that the corporate bookmakers are going to have to recover that money um, somehow and effectively they will be obviously betting at a higher percentage yep. rather, so that they can recover that, um, that, that recover the money so that they can pay out. So obviously paying at 15% is going to be higher than the 8% and 10% in Victoria and New South Wales. So yeah. it, is, it is a cost that is borne by the, by, the, uh, by, the, by the corporate bookmaker. The corporate bookmaker passes that on, as I say, through, um, through betting at a high percentage. So the, uh, the consequences of betting at a high percentage are the lower returns for the, for the punter, mm. that where maybe they were getting $1.80 or something in the past and they're now getting $1.65 or $1.70. Yeah. Um, that may it also may affect you know bonus bets and yeah. other and other um, attractions that the corporates potentially could be giving to uh, to the punter. So is the, is the government <laughs> is the government the only organisation that doesn't understand that the revenue that's being raised from PAC is through our industry, yet not one cent comes back to us? Is that is that um, do your head in when you're trying to work out how the hell can we grow this when there's a big pot of revenue, potential revenue sitting there that we just all of a sudden been taken away from us? Yeah, we're, we're working and, and, and talking to the government yep. about our position because like any business, the government want us to put, put to them a business case and how it affects yep. the industry in the state and that's what we're doing and we're meeting, I've had, I've had a meeting today with one of the ministers and it's, uh, it's really just advocating um, you know, the importance of the tax and and how it does affect all our participants, whether they be trainers, owners, or the people that are associated with the industry through hmm. either being you know, a farrier or, or a veterinarian or someone that yeah. supplies the feed or, or someone that works in a stable. It has a, it has a, a, a ripple effect all the way through. So we're, you know, we're advocating our case to government, as are the other codes yeah. um, in South Australia. Can you see that having, if, if you win that battle, whether it's 2%, 4% that comes back our way, can you see that having a pretty big effect on the general confidence of industry participants, is that...? Oh, obviously it will, if we know that we're going to get some um, a, a percentage or share. Um, some of the other states, or the other states have done deals that vary yep. with, uh, well not deals, but have negotiated with government yep. at, on, at varying levels. Um, it's really getting that confidence and knowing that we are going to get some money and that you can then make it, then put it in your budget. Uh, we don't know if we're going to get it, so yeah. we can't budget for it, but if yeah. we know if we know in December that we're potentially going to get some money in, in June or July, yeah. then um, then we can budget for that and we can work out if it's a calculation based on a percentage or, or a dollar amount, we can then uh, factor that into the to our prize money um, budgets and, and all the other um, spends that we do. And that yeah. includes uh, grants to clubs or, or whatever we um, want to spend or how we can spend our money. Yeah. Now, one of the other big topics on the agenda is racing at the Gawler Harness Racing Club. Now, um, we've seen over the last 12 months um, them conducting trials at their new training facility. And we also saw a media release a few months back about them possibly building a track on the inside of the uh, Gallops track. Now, where do Harness Racing SA stand with the development and the future of racing at the Gawler Harness Racing Club? 
Well, Gawler have got, have got their Gawler Cup meeting uh, yep. in, in February, back at their own track, which is an exciting uh, development. Yep. And then what we want to do from there is leverage off that and you know, run conduct regular meetings at Gawler. It's a yep. good track, a good facility. Um, it's it's at the probably the 90% completed stage. Yep. The club are very active and, and very progressive in trying to... to uh, to make that happen, and, and but we, you know, it's it's in a, in a in a great state to run a meeting yep. um, in February, and, and the Sunday is a really good day to run a cup at a, at a local meeting. Yeah. Yep. With regard to um, you know, potentially moving inside the the Gawler thoroughbred track, you know, there's obviously been negotiations and, and talks with the the Gawler, uh, club, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to uh, to funding. Yep. Uh, and it, while the the, the infrastructure is there, the track needs to be built, and um, that is really the only. Um, thing that needs to be done, all the other facilities are there, the stables and the, and the amenities, so it really comes down to a funding issue, if, if, um, what it would cost to put the track in, and you know, that's, it, it, it's uh, not insignificant, mm. it's, a, it's a decent amount of money, so that will have to be found from, some, from somewhere, and um, the matter will only progress really when that money is, uh, is available. available. Mm. And just lastly, uh, the Trollers rating system, it's been a few months since that's being introduced as well. What has been the general feedback from industry participants regarding the new rating system? Yeah, it, generally it's been really positive, mm -hmm. um, but like anything, when there's winners, they're positive, and when there's losers, they're not so positive. <laughs> um, but it is, it is a precursor for what's to come. Mm -hmm. um, the national, there was a proposed national uh, rating system to come in and about the middle of the year, mm -hmm. which will um, effectively be a significant change to the industry from where the current country and restricted fronts are. There'll be one rating system uh, for all horses. So wh why we brought the rating system in for the trotters here, there was a significant amount of disparity between um, the, the marks that some of these horses were racing off and yep. under the old you know, fronts, they were basically uncompetitive. So what we've tried to do is uh, make the horses more competitive and, and put them in in, an in a situation or environment where they are capable of winning a race. One thing that has happened with trotters, and um, from a horse background I know um, what it's like, and I used to race a lot of trotters, the, um, the dynamic of the racing for trotters has changed, where horses used to be able to win off 60, 70, 80 metres. Yeah. But the reality is now they're going far harder off the front, and horses to make ground off, off back marks or win off back marks, mm. it's becoming increasingly more difficult. Yeah. So we've uh, endeavoured to bring those um, Particularly those horses with high handicaps that have, has, may have historically earned their mark some you know, years ago, but are, are penalised because of it in later life, bring yep. them back closer to the to the fields. And you know, there's been very few of them win off back marks. You know, so it's uh, I think it's working really well. But there'll be some that uh, that are in fear of it yeah. because it's, it represents a change yep. and it's it's not what they used to. But uh, uh, what we've seen is a lot of the finishes have been really good and really close of those horses that haven't broken stride during the run. Yep. So it, 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 overall, I think it's a, it's a positive and uh, we'll be progressing forward with it. Mm. Well, Ross, love to get you back because there's so much to talk about with the yearling sales. I think that's a really positive thing that we need to have a good discussion over, probably almost a full show, mm. really, to talk to you about mm. the yearling sales and the SA Cup, of course, uh, and the Gawler Cup, which will follow two weeks after the SA Cup. So there's some really good momentum to them. We've got the Derbies, of course, and the Trotters Cup. So... If we can, we'd love to get you back in no a couple of weeks' time and just spend a fair bit of the, the show talking about these fantastic opportunities that are coming up for hopefully local trainers and owners to earn some money. Absolutely. Um, and, um, and buy some very, very nice yearlings at the sales for prices that uh, I don't see interstate. Mm. So uh, thanks for coming in, mate, and we'd no certainly worries. love to get you back in for a 15-minute segment very quickly. No worries at all. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Ross. Just Wrecking Toyota, South Terrace Wingfield, for all your recycled and reconditioned parts. Our huge range covers almost every model in the vast Toyota stable. Proudly South Australian with over 25 years in the automotive recycling industry. So, if you want to save some serious money on anything Toyota, call us on 8359 for fast and friendly service. And a very big welcome back to uh, Mobile Rolling. We're welcoming in the next one of our guests now on this afternoon show. Kayla Rahorik is joining us in the studio. studio. Now, Kayla is the leading concession driver here in South Australia with 11 wins this season and 71 wins overall for her career. Now, Kayla, you're slowly drawing towards 100 wins and you've had a fantastic start to the season. 
Yeah, look, my season's been a pretty good start. Um, been really happy with it. Hopefully to reach 100 at least this season. I want to go a bit better than what I did last season. So. And you started off in the pony trot, Kayla. Tell us the importance of that for the young ones coming through. I mean, you're 19 now, but you've been driving races for three seasons. Um, how important is the pony trots to you? Well, I found pony trots really, really good to start off with. I find here isn't as strong as some other states, and it wasn't really until I went over to represent South Australia with the ponies in New Zealand that I thought, wow, they do it so much like big horses. And so it wasn't so much of a big step from the ponies to the big horses when I came here. But I find the younger ones here don't really get enough experience down there to the big horses so when it comes time to step up to go to the big horses they're like wow that's such a big step well um it's funny you say that kayla because i've always been a big supporter of trying to get the kids to interact with the main drivers a little bit more from the pony trots just so when they do make that transition to the standard bregs they do know a little bit more and they are a little bit more educated uh when they are eventually finished with the pony trots yeah look i feel that if the younger ones pick like their main older driver from the harness racing and interacted with them, it would probably help them out a fair bit and they probably would know a little bit more and it probably wouldn't be such a big step for them but it's just getting the younger ones to, do, to take that step to do it and like you know you always get led around on the ponies where I find in New Zealand and stuff they just let us into the parade ring, we go straight out onto the track on our own and you yeah. sort of have to control your pony a bit more where here you get led around, you don't really get the chance to control them as much because like when you take the next step you're not going to get led around on the big horses all the time and you actually have to learn to control them and be above them sort of thing. Yeah, so you transition into driving in the big races, you say niece of leading trainer driver Ryan Rohorek Aside from cracking hilarious gags every time you see him, what sort of influence has he had on your career? Yeah, look, he's been a really big influence on me. I uh, had a really good start to my driving when I went out to start working for him yeah. because I also had him and Matthew Maguire who took me under their wing and sort of really helped me start off and having that stable behind me sort of helped me out a fair bit. When I find if you have a stable behind you, it helps you get a good kick off yeah. to your career and then Ryan just has always been at me and at me about my driving <laughs> and you know bad drives good drives yeah. I know the lot and it's just now I know when I've stuffed up and I don't really have to talk to him to know I've stuffed up I just get the look and I'm like yeah I know <laughs> like and then we talk about it and like you know I've really improved on my driving from him being behind me yeah so is it more though we did driving not just being a good driver, but you need to know the horses are in, you need to know their form, you need to know whether the horse and the death will, will come back in your lap if you don't go. Is there, is there a lot of form studying to be done prior to the races or you just, a lot of times it's, let's go to plan A, B or? Yes, yeah, studying form is a huge thing in races. I struggled with that early until my uncle got on my case and said <laughs> like, you know, you need to know because without knowing the horses around you, you just won't. Yeah learn and so I was like yeah and I, I really focused on it because you know you need to have your plan A, B and C because not always the first plan works out and some people might change the way they drive their horses instead yeah. so you always got to just make sure you have a second plan to go to but I find that you know studying form and all that before the race is a huge thing for driving. Well, Ryan hasn't been the only massive influence. You've formed a good relationship with multiple trainers inside the industry. Just for example, Shane Loon, who you drive for on a frequent basis. What are some of the other trainers who have been a big influence on your career so far? Yeah, look, I'd have to say Shane Loon has been a real big influence on me. Like, I drive most of his team week in, week out, and he's been at me about my driving and has helped me as well. I don't really drive for another trainer as, as such, but I do get along with Danny Hill and like she helps me out a lot and she knows a lot about horses around her, so I talk to her about it. 
sometimes, but yeah, there's not really another trainer that I drive for all mm. the time. I sort of drive for a bit of everyone. But having said that, you go to Mildura regularly as well, and there's a lot of trainers up there who are very happy to use your claim. Yeah, I, so I go up and I drive for Danny. Um, I drive Crowbar Johnson for yeah. him. Um, he, I get him nearly every week. I go to Mildura. Yeah. He had a, he's a bit of a hard horse Sounds to like drive. Sounds like a wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a bit of a hard horse to drive, and you know. Danny's real picky of who drives him because he's really got to know him and yep. he wasn't happy with a few drivers and he said, oh, can you come back and drive him? So I go up for him and I drive for Pete O'Brien up there yep. for a bit and Glenn Douglas, when he brings the team down, I get a few of his claim drivers, which, yeah, I really enjoy going up to yeah. Mildura and driving. Yeah, it's a great spot. Mm. Yeah. So are you keen to become a little bit more full-time in harness racing at this point? And what do you think needs to change to become a full-time uh, participant? Yeah, look, I'd love to become a full-time participant in harness racing. I find, you know, the juniors don't get as much help behind to start off with their careers and, you know, the stewards and all that sort of, you don't really know how to talk to them sometimes. So, you know, juniors without help won't become a career because they just sort of fade out of it a bit. But I find I've been doing it for three seasons now and I want to continue it. And I find prize money to become a full-time thing without another job. Prize money here is a bit poor. That's why I do go over to Mildura for the extra yep. money sometimes. Because it's just hard to live off of a poor little bit of prize money. Yeah to be a full-time job. Yeah. Well, Kayla, thanks for coming in. Uh, we'll continue to watch your success in the next uh, nine months and see if you can get that 100 wins before the end of the 18-19 season. Well done. No worries. Thank you. Etches. With over 30 years combined experience, we endeavour to make your presentation the best it can be. We specialise in all things corporate, from your company's major awards through to your club's trophy needs, as well as sports uniforms and equipment. Our giftware range is second to none, which you can view on eBay. All you do is just type in Etches. Etches is proud to be your one-stop shop, making everything a whole lot easier for you. Etches, proudly supporting harness racing in South Australia. Please come and see us at 142 Port Road, Home Marsh. And welcome back to Mobile Rolling. Our next guest today is SA legend of the 70s, 80s, 90s, Jumpin' Jack Bashara. Well, well, uh, welcome to the show, Jack. Thanks for having me here. Now, mate, I want to go through a few things. We've had you on various uh, programs with us in the past and always spoken about some of the super horses that you trained that I know about and a lot of the older blokes know about. But today I want to ask you the specific question of hot weather race day. So say we're going to Port Perry, it's 39 on race day morning. Uh, what's your preparation to get a horse, A, ready to go? What time do you leave? The race itself, how do you prepare a horse for that? particular kind of weather? Well, being real hot, I'd sail on the horse a couple of days before and give him a, a heap of vitamins. Um, I'd try and keep the horse as cool as possible, um, light work the next day. The day of the race, I'd leave um, pretty early in the morning and try and get up there and get in the shade somewhere at somebody's place. Mm -hmm. uh, keep hosing the horse down without scraping it. Um, and right through the night, I'd just take the horse down every half hour or three quarters of an hour and keep the horse cool with water and uh, try and just keep the yeah. horse cool as possible because travelling in the heat, it, it, it knocks most horses around. Only a few can handle it. Yeah. So and You're a big one on not scraping the horse down on a hot day when you're taking it to the wash well, and bring it back and drip dry. Is that your when we were living in that? Yeah, when we were living in, the, in, in Western Australia, we used to go to Fred Kersley's place yep. and... Uh, Greg Harper, and they'd never ever scrape a horse in, in, in hot weather. They'd, they just wanted the water to seep back into the, into the pores of the skin, and uh, they thought the horse did a lot better. So, um, and then they'd walk the horse for 10 minutes after, yep. just to cool it down and, and, and keep it prepared. But I think it, it, it's got a lot to do with amino acids and vitamins that you've got to put into the horse. When you come home from the races, you've got to treat the horse the same way as you treat it before the race so that you're replacing lost energy because they dehydrate and they lose a lot of sweat. So electrolytes is number one. Yeah. 
Well, Jack, it's no secret that I'm a younger bloke and uh, I didn't really get to see the heyday of harness racing back in the 70s and 80s. Um, now, there's some obviously uh, some main differences uh, in the sport now when it comes to uh, crowd numbers. Um, from your personal op opinion, from your personal perspective, what do we think, what do you think we can do as a sport to improve things? Well, TV, Sky Channel, corporate bookmakers that come into the industry, people don't want to go. Mm. People don't want to go to, to any sport, only the Adelaide Oval. Um, outside of that, um, harness racing, racing down at Morpherville, they just won't go. They, they want to, they want to leave, leave their lounge chair where they've got access to all corporate bookmakers. They can go up and get a drink out the fridge and have something to eat and they don't have to do it, don't have to move. They've got their computers, their iPads, and they can bet like they want and they're getting deals from all the corporates. Yep. You put so much money in and they'll match it. So the incentive is you don't need to be on course. There's no more bookmakers. Yeah. So, um, and, and the tote, you, you have an account with the tote and just ring up. Yeah. So back in your day, Jack and I remember in the 80s, I'd speak to you regularly and we, we used to have a lot of interstaters come to the carnival. Yeah. Let's just go through a couple of names. Brian Hancock, Inter yeah. Dominion King, Fred Coosley would yeah. come over, Greg Harper, Ted Demler, John McCarthy, yeah. and they'd all start the semaphore stables with Jack yeah. Bashara. They wanted to be near the Why beach. Why was that, mate? The beach. They wanted to be near the beach. When our Sir Vancelot came over one year, he never even, he took the horse down the beach and just walked it in the water for a whole week and won the, uh, won the final. Yeah. And uh, McCarthy's were, were never hard workers. When, the, when they prepared their horses for the big race, they did a little with them by just walking them in the water or swimming down the beach. Yeah. And looking after them, but they, they wanted the beach. Yeah. And you obviously picked their brain while they were here, mate, about oh, how to improve your horses. and Every one of them was more than helpful. And the relationship you could have, if you didn't know someone and know something, you'd ring them up and they'd, they'd give you their guidance and the best of their knowledge. And, and it helped tremendously. And is that a part of what you think is missing in harness racing today, that there's a more insular feel about it and there's not the... Um, we're not privy to give out the information as easy as what we did back in those days? It's it, was, it was a lot different back in them days because you could get a lot of New Zealand horses over yep. and a lot cheaper um, and people could race them here in South Australia. Um, now you've got to pay 20 grand for a horse, eight grand to get it over. It's not practical to race it here yep. because the state money's just low. You can't be racing for 2,000 on a, on a Monday afternoon and you've got four or five owners in. Well, they, they'd tip the barman more than they'd get out of that. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's just not, not practical. Yeah. And now the horses go from New Zealand to Western Australia, Melbourne, um, because they're, they're racing for uh, 20 grand a race. Yeah. And we're racing for something that in, in the 1980s, we were racing for seven grand. Some of the meetings were seven grand. They're just seven grand for a couple of races now. Yeah. So it's just been a, a downhill slide. And... I don't think there's anyone in particular to blame. I think it's just the way that the industry has fallen. And you can't blame yeah. anyone. Well, your stable was full of them too, yeah. Jack, back in those days. You, you got a couple from interstate, but generally your horses were New yeah. Zealand yeah. horses. How did, how did you pick them, mate? What, aside I, from just picking the horse, what did you go through to get the... Well, I went over there. I, went over, I was educated by a pretty smart bloke, um, old Bert Whitburn, when yep. he was alive and... He said, you must go over there, drive the horse on their track, but don't ask the horse to do anything. Ask the horse to be put in a registered trial so that you could feel the horse in a registered trial, get a blood test taken of the horse, and then negotiate. If you made a deal with it, you could get a full examination done, x-rays on the horse, and you got the horse over here. And, and all the horses that I had from New Zealand all did a big job. Yeah. Maybe. And the dearest one we bought was $12,000. And he, Mount Sampson won about 14 or 15 races and yeah. had bad legs in the finish. Yeah. So, but yeah, you, you know, people, like, you couldn't bring your family in because there wasn't enough wages to, to support your family. Mm. And if your family wanted to be part of harness racing, how could you pay them? Because you weren't racing for enough and that uh, mm. distracted them to go, my eldest son's in television, but he, he wanted to be part of the horses but unfortunately, you can't do it. Yeah. And he'd be earning stacks of money now. Yeah. But that's the way it is. So if you yeah. want to buy a horse in New Zealand, mate, and the starting price is 10, what do you buy it for? 
well, you start, you go half. <laughs> you cut them immediately in half. <laughs> so, yeah, they said to me one day, uh, they said to me one day, if you're on an island, and there was, an, and there was only three people that, a New Zealander, <laughs> yourself, and a tiger. Well, you'd shoot the blood tiger and take, and you'd shoot the New Zealander and take your chance with a tiger. <laughs> All right, Jack. It's been a pleasure having you on as usual, mate. And hopefully, we can get you on sometime again in the future. Uh, Plenty more to talk about, Jack. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. You're a wealth of knowledge, and it's, we thank you again for coming well, on today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Good on you, Jack. guys and here we are again with our resident veterinarian Toby Ryan down here at Globe Derby Park this afternoon. A couple of topics that we've been hot and well talking about is teeth, horses and their teeth. What goes on? What happens with it all? Okay Liz, yeah. Teeth are um, critically important. A lot, a lot of ac action starts there. Obviously they're the, the way a horse obtains its food and then obviously has to crunch its diet break it down to a point where the rest of the gastrointestinal tract can utilise it more effectively. So that's all the digestive aspect of teeth, but I guess what we might do, having a harness racing slant to this show, is talk a little bit about some of the problems that might arise uh, if the teeth aren't well maintained. Um, this time of year, we've got a lot of two and three year old horses trying to get going, trainers are trying to get their young horses going. And uh, you know, if they're not comfortable in the mouth, if there's sharp edges or caps evolving and coming away or getting impacted with food and being uncomfortable, you know, horses are going to have a tendency to be gobby and, and erratic with their mouths. And that's and from having the bit in their mouth, yep. it's making the contact with it and all those sorts of things while they're in motion, that affects... Yeah, absolutely, because contributes. they'll try and evade sharp edges or evade discomfort. So a natural thing then is to open the mouth more, turn the head, try and evade contact. That, of course, then leads to the horse in our terms, hanging or, or not running in a true alignment. And yeah. of course, in a pacing or trotting gait, alignment is so vital that, that if the horse isn't running in a good true alignment, or next thing you know, it's gonna hit its knee more or crossfire more and, and you know, have a, a vast amount of gait-related problems that could probably, uh, you know, one of the boxes that we need to tick is dentistry, you know? Yeah, and is that also sometimes a potential cause for when you see a couple of these horses that are mid-race and they will collide, is that where perhaps sometimes one is avoiding the bit because of teeth issues potentially? It's possible because, you know, the steering it, you know, drivers need to be able to have confidence that when, when they ease a horse one way or another, the horse will respond. Yeah. And a, a horse with teeth issues is less likely to respond favourably and of course, then when you combine it with competitive adrenaline and the aspects of racing that is often new to these young horses anyway, they, uh, they will overreact, you know? So, you know, you can have situations where two horses will, will, will veer towards one another, drivers will need to steer them away, but, you know, they'll continue to veer away from mouth pain and perhaps lock up, lock wheels, lock shafts, um, you know, create racing issues, you know? So, yeah. um, you know, but they, they, a lot of these things can be identified before the racing stage and, uh, and, and be addressed, you know, with, with dentistry. I'm not one of these vets that maintains that vets have to do teeth. I think there's some wonderful horse dentists out there too. That's what I was going to um, ask. And I is it something that is a specialised field as well or just it's more a generalised field? Training is of benefit. So, you know, we, there's no doubt we can argue with that. But, but there are certain vets that insist on doing their clients' teeth. I feel like there's plenty of good, well-trained, well-researched and studied horse dentists too that are capable of doing a really good job with a horse's mouth. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time. And no back worries. over to you guys. Pronto United Finance provides a professional, friendly and personalised service, offering competitive consumer lending solutions for whatever your current lifestyle finance requirements may be. We offer secured and unsecured loans for all types of items and occasions, large or small. It might be for a car or motorbike, a boat, a jet ski or caravan, and even horse floats. It might even be for a holiday or wedding. Contact us today, get your pre-approval in place and your mind at ease. Pronto United Finance, putting your personal needs first. Lockie, good to see Toby's segment on uh, horses' teeth and preparation, and we've got a whole lot more segments coming up with Toby in the next five or six weeks, which will be uh, interesting viewing as well. Well, if you want to know how to uh, look after your horse, Toby's a man, that's for sure. He's very educational when it comes to uh, that sort of stuff, and very interesting listening to that segment there. Yeah, mm. and that's it for our uh, first segment, uh, first episode, sorry, for uh, Mobile Rolling. Plenty to talk about, plenty of guests to come. Uh, hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next week.